Thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Um, the webinar today is about the hidden truths about onboarding and collections. My name is Dominic D'Andrea. I'm a key account consultant uh, for Credit Watch based here in Victoria. I've been with the business for nearly four years now. Um, many of you obviously know Credit Watch. We're obviously an asset listed broker. Um, you know, 55,000 customers. I think one of the key things is that 90% of those customers are unique to us. And that gives us some great data and insights, uh, as well as us obviously being an end-to-end -end, um, credit risk mitigation, not just for accounts receivable, but also for accounts payable. Um, so today I have two panelists with me uh, today that I'd like to introduce. Um, so first off, we've got Nestle Ledlin uh, from Ledlin Lawyers. Um, so remember when your PE teacher made you divide the uh, the class into teams when you're when you're obviously playing sports. Um, well, as a formidable opponent and essential ally, Nestle is the first pick on your legal team. Uh, with, double, with a double degree in law and psychology, Nestle understands the science behind human behavior. She knows that soft skills can also be the real way to achieve great results with clients. Thank you for joining us, Nestle. Um, we also have Matt McFreedies. Uh, he's head of uh, Credit Watch Collect. Uh, Matt has founded and operated two businesses and has experienced firsthand the pains of late payments and lumpy cash flow. Uh, now as head of, uh, as credit, head of Credit Watch Collect, and Matt devotes his time to helping businesses, large and small, automate their collections process and boost cash flow to free up time. So thank you both for joining today. Um, Thanks, Matt. Oh, it's a pleasure. Um, just before we kick off, we obviously want this to be as interactive as possible. So if anything kind of piques your curiosity or you want to ask a question, there is the ability to ask questions in your panel there. We'll leave them to the end, but just make sure that you put them in there when you hear something so you don't forget them later. And if we don't get to the questions in the webinar, we'll, we'll get back to you afterwards. Um, there's also going to be a poll at the end of the webinar, so please stick around for that. We always love uh, to hear your feedback and if you'd like us to reach out. So. Um, to start off, Nestle, can you give us a little bit of an overview of the state of things? Uh, why are these upcoming months, December and January, typically bad for cash flow for businesses? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Dom. I think what I'm about to say probably isn't news to anyone really. Um, if we look at, I guess, the economic uh, situation in Australia as a whole, we've got some things happening. Um, the most obvious being inflation, rising interest rates, um, rising costs, particularly in industries like building and construction. We've seen uh, quite a few construction companies going into liquidation recently. Um, you know, we've got the great resignation, we've got labour shortages. So the Australian economy as a whole is, is in a really challenging position. If we then add to that the time of year, um, December, January, um, lots of businesses shut down in this period of time. You've got staff taking annual leave, school holidays, and often we find it's not until sort of after Australia Day that the economy really kicks back into gear again. Um, and if you talk to a lot of banks and financiers, they'll sort of say this time of year it's historically very difficult for collections because people are all trying to hold on to their cash flow and preserve the cash that they do have. Um, and that unfortunately means that creditors can suffer. So generally speaking at this time of year, I would put businesses into two categories. You've got businesses where sales are gonna slow down. You know, There's not as much demand at this time of year for the services. So if I take the legal industry as an example, um, you know, the courts will close down Lots of law firms will operate on a skeleton staff at this time of year. Um, so you're obviously going to have a reduction in sales. You've then got the opposite end of the spectrum where you have your um, retail businesses, hospitality businesses. Those businesses are traditionally going to be um, increasing in sales and business. Um, but regardless of which category your business falls into, everyone's going to be facing the same struggle. and that staffing issues, as I said, payment of holiday wages, um, all those kinds of things that come into play at this time of year. So even if your sales are high, you really still need to keep your eye on the ball and just be monitoring your business performance at this time of year to make sure that you set yourself up for the next few months. 
Yeah, that's a great point, Natalie. Um, we all know cash is king, and like you said, different industries, this could be a big time of year for them where they make a lot of their money, or it could be quite quiet. But with that being said, how can these businesses avoid being cash flow negative during this period? Sorry, we might have lost the connection there a little bit. Matt, could you hear Nestle? I can't. So, no. That's okay. Um, Nestle, we'll try and we'll try and come back to you. Um, while uh, while Nestle's just trying to see if we can get that connection back, um, Matt, obviously you've spoken about you know the problems with you know cash flow, and obviously the back end of that is really around the collections piece, right? We can sell a lot, we can kind of bring in a lot of money, or things kind of slow down, but we still have stuff that we need to kind of you know, bring in, like we said, cash flow is king, getting that money in is really important to the business. Um, as, as head of, you know, Credit Watch Collect, can you explain what positive impact a good cash flow would have on a business? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's a common saying ring, you know, cash is lifeblood or oxygen for a business. And um, I mean, I've experienced this firsthand when cash has been tight, it, it really, changes your focus in the business you could turn into a into a survival yeah. mode you're wondering how you're going to pay pay your bills on time or, or meet your payroll but so makes it super stressful and that's that's really hard to run a business when you're in that mindset you know flight or flight you're not really strategically um there's also the other benefit of having more cash is that you can you know buy more stock and ultimately take on more jobs you know we've seen tradies that with better cash flow they can actually get you know a good number of more uh more jobs done in a given year which increases the top line revenue so it's about having that free cash flow in the business that you can then take the opportunities whether it's hiring a, a new person could be a salesperson um so it really when, when you get your collections and your cash collection sorted it becomes this virtuous cycle of, of growth it really does help propel a business forward that's really really important so uh, some great insights there i mean a lot of this stuff you know we already know we've, we've been around for a while but it's really good to just kind of touch back on these points and kind of really hone down and just re remind ourselves why it's important before we get into these kind of spaces where we start struggling and we start trying to find you know cash in different places you know let's try and plan and say hey look do we need another staff member do we need somewhere uh, you know is there somewhere that we can expand the business and we obviously need cash to do that um Natalie, we'll try and come back to you. Uh, let's see, hopefully, uh, if we've got that audio connection back. What you just mentioned there was, you know, around, you know, the, the, the kind of collections piece. But it's also really important to understand that initial kind of customer acquisition piece. Maybe you could talk to, you know, what having, you know, what it means to have a proper credit risk assessment process before onboarding customers because obviously you know prevention is better than the cure right um it'd be interesting to get your perspective on what that kind of prevention looks like uh while while we're still waiting for natalie i think she's just left and tried to join back in i can talk to this point a little bit um i work i've worked with hundreds and hundreds of different credit switch customers and it gives me um a great opportunity to learn you know what these businesses are doing uh during that credit risk kind of mitigation process and there was another webinar we did on best practice um, like I mentioned before prevention is better than the cure when we're looking at our customers uh, and we're onboarding them this is the point in which we have the chance to try and avoid a lot of headaches in the future unfortunately there are scenarios where we can't kind of prevent things from happening businesses change people get into difficult situations etc etc right but what can we do to try and reduce our exposure to that kind of risk? Well, it's assessing our customers at the initial onboarding pace, right? So when we get to these difficult parts of the calendar year, December, January, if they've been a good payer throughout the last, you know, um, 11, 12 months, then we know that they're probably going to be a good payer moving forwards in the future, right? We want people who pay regular, on time, within terms, but we also want to make sure that they don't have any historically bad information like defaults or mercantile inquiries or, you know, they, they've got another business where there's been issues previously. So when we're onboarding customers, trying to do that in a digitized, automated way with a strong decisioning engine with some really good rules around 
uh, bad customers that you don't want. And every industry is different, right? So we've got to take that into account as well. You might be in an industry where, look, it, you know, it's a risky industry like construction or hospitality. Unfortunately, we still have to do business. We can't just stop doing business with these guys. But what we can try and do is educate our customers at that initial onboarding piece, ongoing through our relationship with them to try and show them how paying us is beneficial, paying us on time is beneficial. It will help them get their orders on time. It means that we have a good working relationship moving forwards. And if we need to do things to help them out, we're willing to do that as long as they've been historically a good customer. So I hope that touches on that point. Um, we were going to also talk to Nestle around um, PPSR uh, and looking at how PPSR is essential for some businesses. Uh, Nestle still hasn't been able to join back into the meeting, but I can touch on this one or two uh, points. Um, PPSR is really important when we get to that kind of further end. You know, if we're, if we're looking at the onboarding piece, the ongoing customer monitoring, making sure they're a good customer, then you know the collections piece, then becoming a bad customer. We then have PPSR at the end of the process. But in order for that PPSR to become effective, which is the PPSR stands for Personal Property Securities Register, it basically what it is, it gives us some sort of protection. It used to be a retention of title clause over any products or services that we provided to these customers. So worst case scenario, one of these businesses goes under, we still have the opportunity to try and recoup some of our funds, okay? Now, in order to have that process in place, that PPSI needs to be registered at the initial stage and the onboarding of a customer within, I think it's two weeks uh, of them actually agreeing to your terms and conditions. And doing that at the start then means that at the end, we have that additional level of protection. You know, it's like, you know, driving a car without insurance, depending on the value of the car and how important it is to you, it could be beneficial to have that additional level of security on them. And then, you know, if insurance is involved, maybe you don't have to rely on the insurance as much. You can just recoup money just through that liquidation process and how that normally operates rather than having to rely on your insurance and then premiums go up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so going back to the collections piece and bringing Matt back into this, because obviously I've been <laughs> talking for myself and Natalie now. Um, Matt, it'd be um, good to understand, you know, talking about that payment piece and you know, the ongoing relationship with customers, you know, sometimes customers forget to pay, right? Um, it'd be good to understand, you know, from your experience, uh, why this happens and maybe some other examples, you know, uh, situations like this in terms of collecting and working on that cash flow. Yeah, sure. Yeah, it's it's really helpful to understand the reasons why people pay late. We did some research. And we talked about 150 businesses to try and get across you know, why people pay their invoices late. The majority of people don't actually want to be bad payers. They do want to pay on time. So for some people, it is the cash flow reason. But one thing we also see is that the invoices are actually incorrect in some ways. So they don't have, say, a purchase order number Maybe they're being sent to the wrong person. Um, maybe they've got the wrong items in them. So, you know, when you're thinking about your, it really does come back to that first onboarding of the customer. If you're capturing the correct details, who are you going to send the invoices to? Who's going to be paying the bill? Who will you then end up sending reminders to? So when you capture the right information right at the beginning, that's super helpful to make your follow-up process a whole lot sharper. So if they've not missed the invoice, Oh, sorry, if I've missed the invoice, everyone's busy. It's easy. Certainly if you're dealing with small businesses, you know, their inboxes are overflowing. So it's not uncommon for them just to miss the invoice. So your follow-up should be quite prompt, should be going to the right person. Um, ideally, you'd be adding things like, you know, email, SMS reminders as well. Just whatever you can do to cut through and, and get your invoice to the top of the pile. Um, there's another reason, though. Sometimes it's actually quite hard for customers to pay your invoice. So I've received a bunch of email, uh, invoices myself and some of them don't even have the bank account detail. They, there's no pay now button. Um, you, know, you go, sure, I owe you this money, but how am I gonna pay you? So if you think about your invoicing process from your customer's experience, maybe you know, send one to yourself. What does it look like to be on the receiving end? Does it look like it's gonna be easy to pay and, and send the funds across? Um, and then if they don't have the cash, um, really that requires being proactive and getting a response, having that conversation with the customer. And, and when we talk about the automation uh, software a bit later on today, um, 
one of the main jobs of that and your outreach is to get that feedback coming back from your customer. So you want to either, you know, send the reminder, they pay, perfect. Um, if not, reply, tell us what's going on and let's make an arrangement because ultimately you want to try and keep that customer relationship and keep that ongoing revenue. Yeah, a couple, couple of great points there. Matt. I think one of the key things that you mentioned there is, is data collection. Us now being in a, in a digital era, there's going to be a lot of different businesses operating in a lot of different ways, but every business is now some sort of software business, right? Whether it's you're using a CRM, whether it's an ERP, whether it's you know a POS system or you know whatever it is, there's always going to be some sort of digitization involved in your business. And it's uh, ideal or best practice to try and make sure that the information coming in at the start is the right information so that moving forward, we're able to interact and engage with our customers in the exact right way. So not just looking at who the primary contact is, but also who's the, who's the accounts payable. You know, this is the person who's going to be paying the bills. I need to make sure that I've got the right person. You know, am I dealing with the directors? You know, worst case scenario, this accounts payable person isn't there. The directors are still going to be with the business. Am I collecting an email? Am I collecting a phone number? Do I have this information? And is this information correct? You know, how do we validate that information? So there's a couple of things that we do in that space with Apply Easy being our main, you know, credit application digital onboarding tool. And then that feeds into our customer CRM and ERP systems so that when we reach this stage, it's really, really important that we can then reach out to these people. But from, you know, speaking with some customers, and Matt, you see this a lot, uh, the current process can sometimes be manual. Right. So it'd be good to get a bit of an understanding. What can businesses do to try and automate and speed up that collections process? Yeah, at, at the moment, I'm talking to probably five or ten businesses a week. You know, as we, we're taking them through our, our software and, and helping them streamline the collections process, and it still surprises me in how many businesses today the process for collections and follow up is still very, very manual. Um, you know, basically it's a person running a report or logging into the accounting system and manually clicking through uh, a bunch of accounts, sending out emails, sending statements. Um, and it's, it consumes a lot of time. And that's really hard when, if you're an office manager, if you're a business owner and that job falls on your plate, uh, it just takes up a huge amount of time that you don't actually have. Um, we do th see some businesses using basic automation, so some basic invoice reminders, but that doesn't really take you all the way through, you know, for a proper collections process. So when we've when we've put in the automation tool that takes it from friendly reminders all the way through to stop credit, demand letters, third party collections, you basically put a proper process in your business for collections. And when you have that automation that goes all the way through, um, it just takes that load off your plate. Like there's so much more that just happens for you. Maybe it's just a nudge that reminds you to take a, a certain task. You know, we don't spam or automate every single aspect of it, but it automates the process and it sets you up to succeed um, in terms of, you know, a best practice process. It's basically what would happen in a really large business with all the resources, you can then roll that out in a small business and basically run the same process and get the cash flow benefits and also the time savings. And it's a heck of a lot cheaper than hiring someone to do it. So that's the, you want to bring it back to the bottom line. You can pay a person to do this job, you know, two days a week or, or more, um, or you can pay, you know, a few hundred bucks and get some software to, to take a chunk of the work out of it. Yeah, that, that's that's a great point, Matt. Great point. Natalie, thanks for, for joining us back. I can see your internet connection is much better. Sorry, sorry we lost you. So sorry about that, guys. I've moved to a different spot in the office. I think maybe that's my computer's way of telling me it's ready for a break. <laughs> it's, it's ready for some annual leave, I think. Um, but yes, I'm, I'm back online, so I do apologise for that. That's okay. Natalie, um, we did touch on a little bit around PPSR, um, but I'm not an expert. I know a little bit about it, but you are. Yeah. You know, following from, from what Matt said around that automation of the collection process, Worst case scenario, we do have to start looking at PPSRs. It would be really good to get some of your insights in terms of how PPSRs can be beneficial in these kinds of scenarios. Yeah, of course. So when we talk about PPSR, what we're talking about is the Personal Property Securities Register. 
Um, that is essentially an online notice board is the way that I like to kind of try to describe it um, for security interests in personal property. Um, and it all comes back to the Personal Property Securities Act. So sometimes you'll hear PPSA, PPSR, people sometimes don't understand the difference. One is the piece of legislation and the PPSR that we sort of refer to is the register itself where you're going to be registering um, the interest that you have in essentially the goods that you are supplying or hiring. Um, so personal property, it's essentially anything outside of land. Um, so if you're thinking about in your own business what you're actually supplying or hiring, you know, it's those tangible assets. And it really comes into its own in an insolvency situation. So if you have, for example, supplied goods on credit to a customer, they haven't paid you, and you have made a, a registration on the PPSR, your customer then goes into liquidation, you are then able to use that registration as security. You can take back your goods or if the goods have been sold and you have an interest in the proceeds, then you can um, follow up the proceeds as well. I think the most important thing to remember about the PPSA is, or the PPSR if you're making a registration is, you actually need documentation that allows you to make that registration. So the number one thing that I see when I have clients coming to me wanting to register and wanting to really take advantage of those security options is that they don't actually realise they need to have something in their terms and conditions. So I will see either people wanting to register without anything in their terms and conditions, or maybe they've actually already gone ahead and registered, um, but they don't actually have a security interest that allows them to do that. So if there's one takeaway from today, I would say after the webinar, go and have a look at your terms and conditions and see whether or not you actually do have any clauses around the PPSA. If you do, that's great. Um, but just make sure that those clauses actually allow you to register. Um, and as we were sort of saying earlier before, before I, I got cut off, this is the time of year it's really difficult for a lot of businesses. So it's a time of year where we see lots of businesses unfortunately going into an insolvency situation. So this is one way that you can protect yourself amongst lots of other ways uh, for, for getting payment back for your goods that you've supplied. Um, and I would also say lots of clients come to me, they're, they're providing a service and they're not sure whether or not the PPSA applies to them. Strictly speaking, it's for um, personal property, but there are ways that you can build what's called a general security agreement into your documentation. So if you are providing services as opposed to tangible goods, there's still a way that you can utilise the PPSA. We just have to do it in a, in a different way within your documentation. Thank you, Natalie. That's great. Really good information there. Um, so thank you, Matt and Nat. Uh, it's now uh, a great time for anyone on the webinar, uh, based on the conversation we had, to ask some questions. I'll give you one or two minutes to answer. Uh, I'll put those questions uh, in the go to webinar questions section. Um, <clears throat> while while we're doing that, I think just to summarise, there was a couple of really key points um, that I, I felt were really important from this webinar today, especially if you're talking about the hidden truths of onboarding and collection, right? So, you know, the first thing is, are we in a good cash flow position? You know, are we in a good position to stay afloat or grow? You know, what are our business goals? And it's from that point which the other things kind of flow. You know, do we have the right information on our customers? Um, what security do we have? You know, are we going to do PPSRs? Do we have something in our agreement that gives us a, that additional protection? And, you know, then how are we going to collect? Is it someone picking up the phone? Is it a couple of emails? Or is it some sort of automated system so that we can focus on those kind of bigger deals with bigger clients, build those relationships over the phone, and then collect all the other stuff, which is really, really important to, to the cash flow of the business because sometimes that smaller thing's too hard. So we focus on that big thing, but then it could be a make or break situation, which is very, very stressful. You know, can we collect some of that smaller stuff in a smarter, more efficient and cost effective way to then not be in that kind of stressful position? You know, so, you know, it's great to kind of think of those scenarios and try and put things in place to avoid those, those problems. Um, but we do have a couple of questions coming in, 
we'll try and get through a couple. Uh, so this one's from Gary. At uh, what stage does one believe that a client is insolvent? Natalie, I'll pass it over to you. Sure. Look, it's a tough question. I guess if we think about the, the sort of true legal definition of insolvency, it's the ability, inability to pay your debts as and when they fall due. So if you kind of think about your business at this stage, if we're talking about hidden truths, unfortunately, according to the strict definition, a lot of businesses probably are insolvent. Um, and that is where the cash flow issue really comes into play because I think I, I heard Matt in between my um, internet dropping out, talking about some reasons why invoices don't get paid. Um, and a lot of those are really simple reasons like, um, you know, a customer's name is wrong on the invoice um, or perhaps a credit was supposed to be granted and it wasn't. So um, strictly speaking, if you know your customer is not is not paying their invoices, um, you need to be having a think about what's the reason for that. Is it because they actually can't pay or is it because maybe there are some processes around um, your sales process, your invoicing process, even your onboarding process, that's not actually allowing that cash flow to come in. Thank you for that, Natalie. Uh, we have a question for Matt. Uh, do you see a big difference, this one's from Damon, sorry. Do you see a big difference to a business cash flow when they implement an altered, uh, automated SMS reminder? So SMS. Yeah, absolutely. It, it does depend on the industry. Like when you're dealing with individuals, then it's really powerful. But then also if you're dealing with small businesses, in effect, they are an individual, they're an owner operator. So yeah, absolutely, if you can get through out of the inbox and onto the mobile phone, then it can be a game changer in terms of getting response and, and payment from people. Um, most systems these days don't allow SMS right out of the box. You know, you don't see that in your accounting system. They rely on email. So SMS gives you that point of difference, gets you noticed. Um, so absolutely an important thing to add if, if that works for your particular customer. Yeah, that's, that's great. And there's a couple of examples there. You know, in construction, we've got tradies out, you know, all day on site doing stuff. You know, they've always got their phone in the pocket and can see a text come through. How often do they really go through their emails, you know, and are they staying on top of that? Okay, mm. great point. I think what, what, what we've seen a couple of times is that people get really used to predictable email reminders and things. So if you can kind of just, you break out of that mold and you, you show the customer that you're actually proactive and you get their attention, then, then you can get things moving again. Yeah, that's great. We've got a bit of a technical question from Kayla. While you're away, away Natalie, I, I mentioned something about the PPSR. You have to register, obviously, within two weeks of them signing the T's and C's. Um, but in this scenario, what Kayla is uh, mentioning is uh, there's a certain, well, PPSR is very complicated. But talking about machines that are kind of hired out or vehicles which are hired out, I know it is a little bit different. You might not have to register a PPSR in two years, but the question that Kayla has is, if it's over that two years, at which point do you have to register the PPSR? Is it when you onboard them, or is it when they start to go over that two-year period? So I think just to clarify in terms of registration, um, the, the time frame within which you need to register is actually going to differ depending on um, the nature of your security interest. So there isn't um, like a set time frame um, for, for all security interests and um, re registrations. The advice that I normally give to clients is regardless of the nature of your security interest, regardless of what it is that you're supplying or hiring, you should make that registration immediately as soon as your customer comes on board. And I think that's where this comes back to the whole onboarding process, you know, using the tools that you have um, at your disposal to really get your processes right. So when your customer, as soon as your customer signs that credit application, before you have even supplied anything or hired anything or parted ways with anything that's important to you in your business, you should make that registration immediately. Um, because yeah, there are a number of different timeframes for registration um, and hire in particular is one that um, is not quite the same as some of the other um, 
security interests. So yeah, best practice is always to do it immediately as soon as your customer comes on board. And then you actually don't have to worry about um, timeframes at all because you know you've done that straight away. Um, and I think um, PPSR logic is something that we often recommend to our clients to use um, to get those registrations done straight away as soon as customers signed up. Yeah, th thank you for mentioning that, Natalie. Um, it is a tool that we do have. Again, we're trying to digitise businesses. We're trying to make this as simple and easy as possible. It's great to get advice from people like Ledlin lawyers. And then once you get that advice, how do you implement it? You know, if you if there's like kind of a human process involved, there could be errors. So what we do in PPSR Logic is set up automated templates for you. And those templates you use for your registration. So it can either be part of that onboarding process. So it creates a registration for you if you want one on a customer as soon as they've been onboarded. So you don't have to worry about those timeframes like Natalie was mentioning. Or you can use it on an ad hoc basis and it's just simpler, faster and easier uh, than going through the um, PBSR, uh, PPSA website. Um, we have another uh, PPSA question. Uh, how do I know my PPS are, uh, PPSA terms are correct? And that one's from Holly. Great question. Um, I am looking at PPSA terms on a daily basis. Um, so I have seen a wide range of um, different PPSA terms. Um, I think the best thing probably to do would be jump on our website. We actually have what's called um, a lead check. So it's a health check for um, PPSA clauses. So you can actually submit your documentation through to us and we will give you a free check of your um, PPSA clause. So if you're concerned about whether or not you actually can register, um, or even if you can register, but you perhaps want some enhanced security with your PPSA clause, we can give you some free tips um, about how, how to do that and how to improve your documentation. Um, and then you can use that as a bit of a risk assessment tool to think, okay, do I need to update my clause? Do I need to update my terms and conditions so that I actually even have PPSA? Um, and what can I do really to, to protect myself as best as possible? So yeah, jump on the website, feel free to submit your terms through to us and yeah, we'll send you a free health check. Um, score out of 10. I'd love to see people getting 10 out of 10s, but I don't think I've ever given one yet in the four <laughs> years that I've been doing it. So <laughs> um, yeah, feel free to prove me wrong. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. So just two last questions. So Veronica asks, what's the name of the tool that Matt's been talking about? It's called CW Collect. You can either reach out to us um, uh, you know, uh, directly through, if you have an account manager, an account manager, or through the website, and someone can be in contact with you to discuss that. And then one last PPSR question here from Caroline, um, asking about, can we register PPSRs after an invoice date? Um, again, a bit of a, um, I hate to sound like a typical lawyer, <laughs> um, but it really is going to depend on um, what it is that you are supplying and the nature of your security interest. Um, so yeah, depending on what that is, um, you will can register at different times. Um, if you are in a situation where you have been supplying and you've been invoicing your customers and you now want to start registering, um, feel free to reach out to me. I can have a chat to you about um, your options because it's going to depend um, for every business. Uh, but yeah, you really need to sort of have a look at um, what your terms and conditions say, um, what sort of things you are actually supplying or hiring, and what you what your customer is actually has actually agreed to. So yeah, PPSA is um, unfortunately very technical. So yeah, I, I'm more than happy for people after the webinar to reach out to me, send me an email, um, give me a call if you want to chat through some of your issues. Um, because yeah, more than happy to help. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, the PPSI is, is is very, very complicated. You know, I deal with a lot of businesses who are doing registrations and the best thing to do is as you onboard a customer, register them. And if you're looking at something, you know, there's kind of exclusion periods to avoid preferential payments and this and that, and it kind of depends. Um, so yeah, definitely great to get some legal advice on all of that stuff.
The other thing I just quickly would say, Dom, is I have given a few webinars um, with Creditor Watch about the PPSA, um, and there's some really great resources on the Creditor Watch website as well. So um, if anyone has time to spare, <laughs> um, I would recommend hopping on Creditor Watch's website and maybe just having a watch of some of those webinars. Just refresh yourself with the concepts. It might answer some of the questions for you. Um, and then, yeah, feel free to reach out if, if you've got other questions. Yeah, that's, that's some great advice. The uh, the website, the Creditor Watch website, there's a webinar section. There's loads of articles. Great resource um, if you're looking for any information. I'm a visual learner, so it really helps me to, to watch and listen. Um, and you can kind of speed it up. They're all recorded there uh, for you. Um, so just before we leave the webinar today, because it's getting to, to that time, um, we do have a poll that we'd like to run. One of uh, the team members is going to run that poll for us. Uh, would you like someone from Coders Watch to get in touch with you uh, with offerings or just general queries? Uh, if you could just answer yes or no, that would help us uh, and also help you, or help us to help you, sorry. Great, we've got a lot of responses coming in. Thank you so much. Even if it's a no, it just lets us know that you're all good on your end. Thank you so much for that. Um, also, the last thing I wanted to mention is that our November Business Risk Index is released today. Uh, there's a couple of really interesting things, and this kind of touches on what Natalie is saying. Um, so the trend towards external administrations leapt 26% uh, from October to November. So like Natalie said, these, these businesses are starting to struggle. We're seeing that in the data. Um, and uh, that's a 24% increase year on year. So that business risk index is really, really a great place as well to just get a kind of pulse on what's happening in the market, uh, just so that you know what's going on. If the overall market's struggling and you're seeing that in your business, great. If the industry, you know, if the market's doing well and you know things aren't showing the same way in your business, it's maybe an opportunity to, to look at what you guys are doing and maybe try and find some different ways of, or solutions to, to fix, avoid or improve something. Um, but on that note, I wanted to thank everyone that attended. I want to thank uh, Matt and Nat for, for joining us today. And uh, if we don't see you again, wish you a Merry Christmas and a very Happy New Year. Thank you guys for joining today. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Tom.